Okay, so moving on with these limasons. <coughs> um, so far we've looked at the case of a cardioid. Uh, next up is the, uh, the case of what we call a one-loop limason. Um, limason uh, one-loop limasons are sometimes also called uh, dimpled limasons, and the reason for that is because if you look at these um, four graphs here, there's this little part that kind of caves in. It looks almost like a circle that's slightly caved in at one point at one part, um, it makes sort of like a dimple shape. So you may hear me call those dimpled limasons as well. Um, as far as the orientation of these things goes, whether they point towards the right, left, up, or down, it's the same idea as the circles and the cardioids. Um, but uh, notice that these graphs don't contain the pole. They don't pass through the pole at all. Um, we can show why that is if you look at the definition of these things. The definition is slightly odd, the way that they write this. A over B is greater than 1 or less than 2. Another way of saying that is that um, uh, if we multiplied this inequality by B, let me see if I can put this over here. Another way of saying that is B is less than A, which is less than 2B. Um so A is going to be larger than B, but not too large, basically, is what that means. That's how you know that we're looking at a one-loop limason. So I'm going to jump straight into an example on the next page to show you what graphing one of these things looks like. And we'll, we'll jump back to this just to reference what the graph looks like. But um, I'm going to start by graphing R equals 3 plus 2 cosine of theta. So A is 3, B is 2. Notice that A is larger than B, but it's smaller than 2 times b. 2 times b would have been 4, and 3 is less than that. So this falls under the category of a dimpled limason, or a one-loop limason. Okay, now to see why this thing does not contain the pole, remember we check to see if it has a 0 by setting r equal to 0. Now, I, if I were to subtract the 3 and then divide by 2, that's going to give me this. Cosine of theta is equal to negative 3 halves. But this has no solution because negative 3 halves is less than negative 1. That means that this is outside of the range of cosine. No solution. The fact that it has no solution means the pole is not on the graph of this function, which we saw on the previous page. Um, now look at, let's look at max and min values. So for this case, I can see because there's a plus here, um, if this term is as large of a positive number as I can make it, then that'll maximize this. So as far as a maximum is concerned, uh, we plug in a 1 for the cosine of theta. 3 plus 2 times 1, which is 5. The maximum value of this thing is going to be 5. What about a minimum value? Well, a minimum value would be what occurs when a cosine is made as small as possible, which is negative 1. 3 plus 2 times negative 1, that's equal to 1. Notice in this case also, the max is the sum of a and b. The min is the difference between a and b, a minus b specifically. Uh, that's a trend that always happens with these, these limasons. So these two values can come from the sum and the difference of those two numbers there. Okay, <clears throat> so if I'm going to go to a graph now, let's come back here. Um, these are the four different cases. Uh, to determine which orientation my one-loop limason is going to have, I look at the fact that I have a cosine here, which means it's going to be symmetric about the polar axis, and I look at the fact that B is uh, positive, or more specifically that there's a plus here. Technically, we think of B as independent of that. So the plus and the cosine means that this is going to open towards the right. I'm going to get a limason. There's the dimpled part. Looks something like that. Mine is all lopsided. I'm never very good at drawing these things, but you just do the best that you can. Um, now, looking at the shape of this, this is supposed to look symmetric about the horizontal axis, but the point that's the closest to the origin or the pole appears to be right here, the center of that dimpled part. That's going to be uh, the 1, the minimum value. Um, if I think of this as like an x and a y axis, I would label this as negative 1 right here. And then my maximum value I can see similar to the cardioid is this furthest point out here. So I'd be calling that 5. 
because that's my max. But what about these two values here? Well, you can see that the angles that correspond to the to this point and this point are pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, both of which, if I plug in a cosine, just give me 0. So plugging those two angles into theta here give me 3 plus 0, or 3. This becomes 3. This becomes negative 3. And once again, just like the cardioid, these two symmetric values are just equal to plus or minus a. So that gives you a shortcut for coming up with those. Okay, so uh, that's the case of a dimpled or a one-loop limason, very similar to how we graph a cardioid. The difference, though, is that this one never reaches the pole the way that the cardioid does. Let's look at the final case of a uh, limason that we care about. Um, this is called an inner loop limason. You can see that there's a large outer loop and then a smaller inner loop for these two types of limassons. Um, the equations for these are kind of like the reverse of the previous case. Instead of a being larger than b, we need a to be smaller than b in order to have one of these inner loop limassons. Orientation of this works the same way as the previous limasson. So let's take a look at this case. We want to graph r equals 1 minus 4 cosine of theta. The cosine tells me that we're looking at one of these two cases where the graph is symmetric about the polar axis. The minus here means that instead of pointing towards the right, we should be pointing towards the left. So that means I'm looking at an inner loop limason that has this form to it. Now these limassons contain the pole. It's where the uh, graph crosses itself in order to create that smaller loop. So to verify why that happens, take this for example, plug a zero in for r, one minus four cosine of theta. If I wanted to solve this, I would get cosine of theta equals one fourth. Now that's not a familiar value. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what value of theta gives me one fourth when I plug it into a cosine, but that's actually not important. What's important is that one fourth is between negative one and positive one. So this has a solution. I could find, I could use an inverse cosine to get one of those solutions, but again, that's not the point. The point is that this thing has a zero, which tells me that it passes through the pole as these graphs indicate here. And then max and min values. What about my max and my min? Okay. Well, I get these two values from uh, plugging either a 1 or a negative 1 in for cosine of theta. And I can see that because this is a minus here, if I make cosine of theta equal to negative 1, I'll get a negative 4 times a negative 1, which gives me positive 4. That gets me a positive number, which is going to lead to my maximum. So the maximum is going to be 1 minus 4 times negative 1, which is 5. And then uh, if I want a minimum, I plug in a positive 1 for cosine of theta. 1 minus 4 times positive 1, which is uh, negative 3. Okay. Now, again, remember in polar coordinates, if r is equal to negative 3, which is what this is telling me, that's just a point that's 3 units away from the pole that's been reflected um, or rotated by like 180 degrees. So it still means three units away from the pole. Now let's see how we use this. Well, I know that we're looking at an inner loop limason that has this sort of a shape to it, this sort of orientation pointing towards the left. So we're gonna have this smaller inner loop here and then this larger loop here, okay? Now this is not drawn to scale. Um, this is just to get the shape in, then I'm going to start putting in some labels. Just like before, these two symmetric values are going to be whatever a was equal to. So I'm going to have a 1 and a negative 1 there. Okay. The inner loop, if I'm looking at these minimum values, or the minimum value here, that negative 3 would have come from getting a 1 for cosine, and I get a 1 for cosine when I plug a 0 in for theta. So if I plug 0 in for theta, that means we're pointing this direction. Um, so the, the point that would have been graphed is the point negative 3, 0. 0 points this direction, but the fact that r is negative means we're actually flipping around and going this direction. Therefore, the minimum value is giving me the distance from this tip of the inner loop from the, po uh, from the pole, and I can call that negative 3 right there.
okay? Um, the maximum value, just from visually inspecting this thing, would be here. So the maximum is 5. Clearly not to scale. The 1s seem much further from the pole than this negative 3 is, which is not supposed to be the case. But again, it's not the scale that matters. It's getting the correct labels. And that's something I'm going to point out for the purpose of um, when, when you get tested on this material. The, it's not enough to just graph the shape. Uh, in fact, I would probably give you no credit for that. Uh, what, what matters is that you're, you're getting the correct labels here. Because I can give you 20, you know, 20, 30, 40 different examples of uh, inner loop limasons that all point the same direction, but none of them are the same graph because these labels could be different. So without these labels, you don't have a graph. You just have, you know, a, a, a nice picture, I guess. Um, so those are the three cases of limasons that we care about. Again, this cardioid, um, one loop, or sometimes we call those dimpled limasons, and then these um, inner loop limasons. Sometimes they call these two loop limasons. There is another case that we're not worrying about. It's called a convex limason. Convex limasons are what happens if A is larger or greater than or equal to 2B. And basically they look like a circle with somewhat of a flat side. Um, but again, not, not going to concern ourselves with those. All right. A couple more um, polar graphs that we care about. So uh, this next one is what we call a lemniscate. Uh, it looks kind of like a figure eight, or you can even think of it as like a peanut if you want. Um, and again, I'm uh, avoiding the, uh, the process of plugging in a bunch of points to, to kind of manually come up with these graphs. Um, your book will do that for a lot of these different types of graphs to show you, hey, here's what this, this graph should look like if you plug in a bunch of points for, for whatever equation you're given. Um, but uh, you, you can look to your book for that. We, we just want kind of the, the basic characteristics of this graph um, and how to, how to get the information that we need from the equation. So notice what the equations for lemniscates look like r squared. So this is one of the only ones that we consider where it's not just an r on the left-hand side, it's an r squared. r squared equals a squared times cosine of not theta anymore, but 2 theta. Notice how each one of these has a 2. So it's a different looking equation than what we've dealt with. These are not limasons. These are their own thing. Um, let's think for a second about um, some of the characteristics of this graph. I can see a couple of points that are very clearly the furthest points from the pole. Those are going to correspond to ma uh, maxima. Um, I also can see that where this figure eight shape, this lemniscate, crosses over itself occurs at the pole. So this, this graph does contain the pole. Um, and uh, the orientation of these things uh, it depends on whether we have a cosine or a sine here and whether or not the coefficient on that sine or cosine is a positive or negative number. So if it's cosine, the lemniscate is going to be symmetric about either your polar, polar axis or your uh, theta equals pi over 2 axis, horizontal or vertical. And the way we distinguish between the two, if this coefficient is positive, it'll be symmetric about the horizontal axis. Negative gives me vertical. If that's a sine instead of a cosine, you can see that the figure eight shape is on a tilt. And it's going to be symmetric about the line theta equals pi over four. That's like a 45 degree tilt right there. Or uh, the line theta equals three pi over four. That's like a 135 degree tilt right there. So let's look at this one here and let's confirm that we do have a zero on this graph. Again, that's what confirms that the pole belongs to this graph. So if I plug a zero in for r, that would be zero squared equals 16 times cosine of theta. Zero squared is zero, and if I divide that by 16, sorry, that should be a two theta, that gives me cosine of two theta equals zero. Now I could solve this for theta, it wouldn't be difficult to do, but that's not really what matters. What matters is that a solution exists because zero is between negative one and one. So that's confirming uh, that we do in fact have the pole on the graph. Maximum and minimum values. Okay. So if I were to take this r squared equals a squared cosine of 2 theta and take a square root of both sides. Let me do this down here. 
then r is going to equal plus or minus the square root of a squared cosine of 2 theta. Now what's important about this is that if I'm, if I'm uh, going to plug in values for theta uh, to get sample points, I can't plug in anything that I want anymore. You may notice, for example, if you plug in, let's say, pi over 2, 2 times pi over 2 would be pi, cosine of pi is negative 1. Now, a squared, because it's squared, is always a positive number. Multiplying that by negative 1 gives me a negative number in here, and you can't take the square root of a negative number. So the domain here, if I think of this as a function, is not all real numbers. I can't just plug in anything that I want. But there are values that I could plug in for theta that would make cosine of 2 theta equal to 1. So if I think about that for a second, uh, then the maximum and minimum values are going to be whatever happens when I plug uh, 1 in for cosine of 2 theta and then take either the positive or negative root of that. So the maximum is going to come from the positive root, a squared times 1, which is equal to a, assuming a is a positive number. Um, in fact, it's probably better to call that the absolute value of a. Similarly, if I want the smallest possible number, um, then negative, the negative root is the one that I want. So negative a squared times 1, which would equal the opposite of the absolute value of a. In either case, the maximum and minimum values give me a point that's a units from the pole. And what that's going to correspond to on my graph is either end of this this peanut shape, this lemniscate thing. So let's see how we can translate this into a graph. Okay, um, so looking at the information that we we need, we need the orientation. Which of these four cases are we looking at? We have a positive coefficient and a cosine. That's the first case. So we should have a lemniscate that's uh, that's um, symmetric about the polar axis. So let's put a point here and a point there. Again, it's just like a figure eight shape. And we're not super concerned about scale or anything like that. You'll notice that as far as labels go, um, the, the, really the critical ones are these two intercepts right here. Both of those, like we said, is A. 16, that's where I'm going to get the a from. 16 is a squared. So the square root of 16 is where I get these intercepts, negative 4 and positive 4. Okay, That's as much as I'm going to be looking for on these lemniscate graphs. Um, I don't really care about how high or how low these little petals or whatever you want to call them go. Um, so that would be sufficient for graphing this function. Fairly simple once you get the idea. Um, okay, so we, we should have one more video after this one talking about roses, and I think we'll, we'll kind of do a passing mention of spirals. We don't spend much time on those, but that's going to wrap this one up.